thank you all for, uh, for saying, um, and also to David DeNoon for uh, inviting me. Um, for, for a while today, I w and before the, the, the meeting today, I was wondering why I was actually invited. I'm, I'm not a China specialist, nor am I a political scientist who studies reform, which is the topic of, of today's conference, but I have a better feel for it after sitting, sitting through today. I'm an urban economist with a strong interest in housing, and I got really interested in China five or six years ago after the U.S. markets busted. Um, I spent a career studying housing in the United States, felt I really didn't understand fully what had gone on in our markets, and China seemed an interesting place um, with rapidly rising prices, a lot of warning signs. So I teamed up with two colleagues, um, one guy named Yang Hingdong, who is, uh, directs the real estate program at the National University of Singapore, and a really great young economist at Tsinghua in Beijing, Wujing. And we've been going at it ever since, and I think, I, I, think I, I now have a feel for why I'm here, and that's because you know, if you're a housing guy like me, just studying the property markets, you know, in Beijing are really interesting, just like they are in Ireland, Spain, other places that have had big boom and, and bust. But here, I think the real reason to worry and wonder and study Chinese housing markets for most of this audience is, is if a problem develops, it's going to affect the ability of China to reform and change its economy from export-led growth to more you know, domestically driven growth. And the reason's very simple, and it's been noted throughout the day and, and by the previous panelists, which is you know, there's just a huge amount of household wealth tied up um, in housing in one way or another, either owner occupancy or speculation, mm -hmm. intergenerational pooling. And if something goes wrong in this market, um, the idea that those folks are going to ramp up consumption strikes me as pretty far-fetched. Um, so that's the reason to think hard about what we're doing here. While I'm rambling on, can someone get my slides up? I don't quite know how it's going to work, work out here. So here's the, here's the problem with that, though, in figuring out um, what's going on in, in China. Do you know how this? Yeah. Let me. <laughs> All right. I had to figure you, it out. You right. do. All right. Uh, Where do you think? I'm right there. Just they double did. click that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You ran the AV club, I bet. <laughs> All right. Um, my son does that. I'm incompetent. <laughs> okay. Me too. <laughs> um, so, uh, my my talk, my my last seven minutes are really on how risky is the market in China, um, and that's a different question for is it a bubble. Um, is it going to burst and the like? And the reason is, I, I'm a professional economist. We don't have very good models of bubbles in economics, and the data in China are incredibly limited. Um, I say the government data are suspicious in various respects. That's a nice way of saying they're not to be believed. Um, so one of the, like you said, they show until the last 18 months, there's been no price appreciation in Beijing, or very little of it, according to the government data. Nobody believes that. Um, so one of the issues, and I think challenges, and that makes it interesting for folks like me, is to build better data. And I'm going to talk about some land price data we've developed um, to try to get at this issue. It's an interesting land should lead the market. It's the residual, in economics terms, it's the residual claimant on house value. It pretty much costs what it costs to build, to put a roof on a house. But land is the shock absorber. When people get optimistic and markets get strong, land prices shoot way up. When things go down, land prices collapse. It's not the physical part of real estate. It's the dirt. So looking at land is very, very interesting. I'll also show you some, a little data on price to rent ratios in Beijing that will be foreboding in terms of risk um, uh, analysis. But again, we have eight years of data in China, basically. We have one big boom so far over the last eight years. Um, one cannot tell anything meaningful about bubbles or mispricing, but you can say it's pretty, it's pretty darn risky and we ought, to be, we ought to be worried. The land price index is for 35 markets. So my co-authors and I, um, along with Sufan, a very big data provider in, in China, um, the way the land market works there, if you're a residential developer, 
um, you have to buy the land from the local government. And by buying the land for the lawyers in the room, it's a leasehold estate. What you're getting is a leasehold <laughs> estate for up to s um, 70 years if it's for residential purposes and all of my data are for the housing market. So, so it is. And essentially, you make an upfront lump sum payment and you have use rights for 70 years. You then build your building and sell um, units to, uh, to, <coughs> to people. Um, to households in, in China. Um, that's the series um, we're looking at, and importantly, it's those 35 markets. It's not just a couple of big coastal markets. That's the index, okay? That's, and there's a bunch of detail behind this. Um, that's the aggregate for the 35 markets in China. The value of land sales is a bit over 50%, so it's a little bit more than half, half the nation. What do you see there? Well, one, a couple of points I want you to take from that. Wow, that's a pretty steeply increasing series. Um, land prices have been going up a lot in China. The index starts at one, so when you see the number four, that means prices are three times higher than when they started, because you start at one. Um, over the last eight years, pr land prices have been going up a little over 15% per annum compounded. So if you just compounded over that entire series, that's misleading, obviously, because you see in China a couple of things. Between 2004 and 2007, you saw one <coughs> increasing period, and you also saw something characteristic of land markets in China, which is there'll be very short periods, the beginning of 2007, where prices went up 71%. Okay, so you'll see smooth increases and then discrete jumps, but you also see declines. This is a real index. It's in 2010 yuan. Um, <coughs> between 2007 and 2009, when the wheels popped off the financial markets in the U.S. and it spread to the rest of the world, real land prices in China fell 34%. Okay? They then, you then saw another very big boom, 2009, 2010. That's a stimulus period. Again, there's no proof that what drove this asset price escalation in this sector was the stimulus. There is strong demand in China. We've, we've heard about the urbanization, and there really is a lot of in-migration from rural areas, but it, it certainly looks like the stimulus may have had something to do with that. That increase over that time period is 122%. We then have a modest 14% drop from the end of 2010 to the beginning of 2012, and then we have 30% from the bottom in 2012. We do have the data for 2000 <coughs> for the third quarter. In thir the third quarter, there was a big increase. The aggregate, incre the aggregate index went up 11% in that quarter. So that's roughly 45% a year if you compound it over four now, okay? That's what happened in Chinese land markets. Um, what do I take from that? Uh, wait, I'm gonna show you some city slides. What do I take from that? One, again, it's a short time period. You can't say anything about, is land mispriced? I don't know. What I know is it's gotten three times more expensive than it was in 2004. Um, what I also know is, by the simple math, that you cannot have another eight years with 15 to 16% compounded annual growth rate. The reason is the numbers go to infinity. If you have another, the way the math works, if you have another eight years of the same compounded growth rate, Land is nine times more expensive. Okay, it's, it's highly unlikely. You have to believe magical things about Chinese wages and productivity to believe that'll be consistent with that. So what I do know from this series is it can't continue as it has, which is a very different statement from, gosh, it must be busting soon. So two very, very different statements. The other thing I want you to take from, from my data is that China is very much like the U.S. It's a real mistake to look only at aggregate data. And by the, by, by the U.S., I mean, think about U.S. markets. New York's really different from my home of Philadelphia, and it's really different from Chicago and Atlanta and et cetera, et cetera. Um, same thing in, in China. Beijing is the political capital. Shanghai is the financial capital. Clearly, they're moving manufacturing into the interior of the country to get lower wages and the like. And you see it in the indexes. These are only annual because we don't have enough data. We don't have enough land sales to report quarterly indexes. Two minutes, um, please. And there, yeah, I'll be done. Um, and what you see here is phenomenal growth in Beijing. 
um, where the aggregate index went up by 300%, Beijing went up by 500%. Um, however, in other markets, um, Dalian, et cetera, 200%. Some markets, you see declines um, out there. You want to see sort of one where it's gone really crazy recently is Changsha um, and, and the like. My, my point is, but not in Qingdu. My, my point is property land certainly looks expensive in a lot of markets. It's escalated sharply, but the story is very, very different in certain markets than, than in others. Don't just speak about the market. Last risk factor I want to talk about is price to rent ratios. Um, my co-conspirators and I have some data on individual sales and rents in Beijing. And my closing comment, I want you to focus on column three of this series. This is a series on price to rent ratios between 2005 and 2010, where basically the same unit or very, very similar units in high rises in Beijing were s either sold or rented. And the point I want you to note there is the price to rent ratio roughly tripled from 17 in 2005 to almost 50 in 2010. Now, for those of you who study property markets, you, you, your mouth should be open. That's an incredible rise, okay? Um, it's another sign it's not sustainable. Um, the other thing to note is a price to rent ratio, there's a, there's a wonderful formula in housing economics due to a guy named Jim Paterba at MIT who directs the National Bureau of Economic Research now. But Paterba has this wonderful equation which lets you back out what must owners be thinking about future price growth to make living in their house as good as renting an equivalent unit. And the answer from the Beijing data is you need price growth of 6 to 8% a year for these numbers to make sense. Now, in some years, Beijing gets more than 6 to 8%. Like I said, land prices in the third quarter went up a lot more in, in Beijing. But that's a very high number over time. And my point is what makes markets risky is that even short negative shocks will cause these prices to drop a lot once you have very high prices relative to rents or very high prices relative to incomes. Um, and what makes it difficult to forecast, yeah, last 10 seconds, what makes it difficult to forecast is demand's really strong, right? There really is a lot of in-migration. But my final sort of note of caution to those who go, urbanization will save everything in the Chinese housing markets is we thought that was true of Las Vegas and Phoenix. The last 40 to 50 years, there have been massive inflows of population to the southern and western regions of the United States, and it popped there too. So I see the warning signs. I wish I could tell you that I knew when something might change. I don't, but what I do know is the trends have been so strong they can't continue for a long period of time. Thank you.